May I extend a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined us online for this session of our 14th Annual Global Citizenship Conference. My name is Hugh Morshead and I am the Head of Government Advisory at Henley & Partners, the world's leading residence and citizenship advisory firm. The title of today's webinar is The Emerging New Global Mobility Hierarchy in the COVID Era. I think we can all agree that the pandemic's impact on travel freedom has been far more drastic and long lasting than initially anticipated. And as we pointed out in the latest Henley Passport Index report published in October, the seemingly unshakable dominance of so-called premium passports from developed countries such as the US, the UK, EU member states, and even Singapore has been completely upended. For instance, at the beginning of the year, the US passport was ranked sixth with Americans able to travel hassle-free to 185 destinations. But since then, that number has dropped dramatically by over 100, with US passport holders currently able to access fewer than 75 destinations. Joining me on today's panel to discuss the emergence of a new global mobility hierarchy is Dr. Dimitrios Papadimitriou, co-founder of the Migration Policy Institute, Curtis Chin, managing director of the advisory firm River Peak Group, and former US ambassador to the Asian Development Bank, Justice Malala, award-winning journalist, author and entrepreneur, and Rob McNeil, Deputy Director at the Migration Observatory at Oxford University. Welcome everybody. Justice, you are a South African currently living in Los Angeles. As America recovers from the recent presidential elections, do you think that the lack of US leadership on the coronavirus pandemic has permanently devalued the country's passport power and international standing? And is there anything to learn from the current tensions between the USA and China in this regard? Hugh, thank you so much for your question. I think the key thing about what you're asking is, is one word, permanent. Is the damage permanent? Is what has been done uh, to the United States and its standing something that uh, will go on and on and rumble on for a long while? Or can the new administration uh, change all that? I think the key thing is to remember that the United States has taken a knock, not just at the level of the pandemic, but at various levels. Diplomatically, the past four years has seen the United States standing in the world um, increasingly questioned, um, many question marks about handling of uh, the relationships with China, for example, and others. And so I think the pandemic and the fact that the United States has seen its mobility and its citizens' mobility so curtailed, as you so ably uh, uh, said in your opening remarks, there has been uh, a lot of other factors that have played into the United States' um, standing, if you will, in the world. How long will this take? Can it be turned around? The United States' power and reach is vast. Um, culturally, I like to say, you know, many of us are American, really, because we grow up with the idea of the United States, uh, its power, its cultural presence all over uh, 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 many, of our, many of our countries, continents, and so forth. And so a new administration that has the will, uh, has the political will, to change things, can turn around things, in my view, within 100 days of coming into office. And so your, your question and the word you use permanently, my view is that these things can be turned and can be turned around very quickly. And that in my assessment, I think that a new administration would be able to begin to show the world that, in fact, there is a science-backed handling of the pandemic that would see changes coming through and coming through
quickly. At the moment, as you rightly say, I'm about to get on a plane to South Africa, and I know that Americans are struggling to get into South Africa because it's no, don't come in. And so uh, these are some of the factors that a new administration have to, have to work with. Coming from um, Africa and, um, and talking about China and the United States, you know, the, the past four years, we've seen an escalation, if you will, of uh, a trade war, uh, the war of words between the two uh, countries. This has an impact globally. Uh, in Africa, there's been a kind of great power rivalry uh, between these two. I think that a, as things change, as you say, coming out of the, the presidential election, there may be a sort of detente, a sort of uh, thawing of relations. This is good for uh, continents like Africa, where uh, hopefully a, a buoyant Chinese economy will lead to demand for uh, African raw min uh, minerals and so forth. And, and so a thawing of relations might lead to, might lead to things getting relatively better than they have been uh, these past four years, uh, both for the United States and I think for uh, continents like Africa and, and elsewhere. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Dimitrios, you are currently based in Washington. How do you think the massive resurgence of COVID-19 across much of the world and its likely subsequent waves will affect decisions about borders and travel. Thank you very much, Hugh. It's a pleasure to be part of this um, uh, extremely good panel, and I'm looking forward to listening to the rest of our colleagues around this virtual table. Um, I think that you have it right, um, because COVID-19 is not anywhere near anywhere near having run its course. Um, I think that we're focusing on this massive second wave, but I think that we ought to think much harder than that because there will be subsequent waves. I think we're not going to be rid of this, um, I guess, virus. Um, even if a vaccine or several vaccines become available until sometime in the second half of next year, and then there are going to be all sorts of unknowns about the efficacy of the vaccine, how long vaccination really protect you from, and the possibility of the virus mutating. I mean, we all know that uh, the Danes, Denmark, has decided to call kill its, its entire mink population of 15 million minks because the virus has mutated. So we're not out of anywhere near out of the woods and we don't really even know where the woods, the woods end. As a result of that, I think that not only will the labor market and economic effects of the virus be long, and difficult because they will last longer than we think, they will be deeper than we think, but we're also going to be looking at structural unemployment. Now, I know that most of these issues relate to migration, but migration is one of the things that we're talking about because mobility includes both travel and migration. So both migration and travel will indeed be unsettled for most of the next year, but also for the year or two or three after that. We all are going to have to make adjustments to this. Um, some of these adjustments will be permanent. For instance, working virtually, as we all know around this table, is going to be fairly permanent, permanent for many people. Meeting virtually, will cut into business travel, which actually keeps the food entertainment and travel industry afloat. So these are going to be all difficult. But to, more to the point of the question, I think that anything that 
create greater opportunities for travel, we'll have to sort of break through a couple of carriers, the most important of which is trust. Will people continue to trust their government that they have things under control? Will they trust taking vaccines? Do they trust that governments, even after we seem to be in control of the virus, can stop the further spread of the virus? And these are all unknowns. But looking at my crystal ball, I think that borders will be reopening, but the reopening is going to be very uneven and intermittent. Uh, I see lots of backs and forths. You know, if we and if we see that opening a border increases the incidence of infection, then I suspect governments may decide to sort of shut it down again selectively. And this is important for us to understand because selectivity, selective, being selective in mobility is really something that we can all anticipate. I'm certain, fairly certain about it. And that selectivity includes whom to allow to travel, from where? Because clearly, uh, at least the US government, but I suspect most of the Europe, European governments will have, let's say, entire states, by that I mean countries, on their not travel list until essentially there is some equilibrium between infection rates and control of the virus between, uh, let's say, the destination and, of course, the place of origin. I also think that the requirements prior to allowing one to get on a carrier even are going to really become much tougher. And some of those will continue to follow a traveler at destination. And before we're ready to actually do that, we're going to have to have a whole raft of adjustments that we make at, let's say, airports. And I want to focus on airports and seaports because in cases like the United States with the long border, you know, south and north, only cooperation between our northern and southern neighbors can try to control this whole thing. Among the kinds of adjustments that will be required, we're going to have to build new infrastructure. We are hardly even beginning to do that because we know that there are many functions that governments make or do at the border, not only immigration, but also, you know, making certain that customs officials are involved, all sorts of possible threats need to be kept out. And now we're going to have to accommodate essentially um, new, if you will, administrations or, you know, new bureaucracies that specifically focus on the virus. Um, and of course, um, we have to become confident that the testing that we do is indeed reliable. I don't mean 97% reliable, I mean 99, 100% reliable, it goes back to the earlier point I made about trust. And we're gonna have to create areas in airports for quarantining in place. This idea that somehow, you know, you will order a passenger to quarantine at their homes and all that doesn't work for a vast and uncoordinated country like the United States. The, the efficacy of vaccines is also going to be a big issue as I uh, noted earlier. The, fourth, the third thing is costs. Who will bear the costs of all this. Uh, clearly, the government is not going to pay for it, at least not beyond a very, very short initial period, which means that the airlines will have to do that, which means that passengers will have to do that. If you consider that, it could very well mean that not everybody will be able to travel with the same ease and efficiency and relatively low costs as we did before this pandemic. And finally, we're going to have to be much more trusting, a different kind of trust, of vaccine records, however digitized they are, and the reliability of these records. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Curtis, over to you in Virginia. 
usually you would be based in Singapore or Thailand, given your work with the Milken Institute. As you pointed out in the recent Henley Passport Index report, COVID-19 and changing travel policies will not change Southeast Asia's growing importance in the world. Thank you, uh, Hugh, indeed. Joining you from uh, Virginia versus my normal stopping ground in Singapore, uh, Bangkok, and uh, also in Indonesia. But indeed, you know, the world is really shut down. Uh, no matter what passport you had, it's so difficult now uh, to travel. And, and actually what I fear in some ways is a growing inequality as the world changes and adapts to who can travel, where can you travel to. Even citizens from one country might be treated differently. Um, as countries think through that balance of addressing COVID as as a, yeah, health as a medical issue, but also the implications of economic shutdowns, which have really now forced countries to rethink how far they should go in stopping people from another country to visit. You know, so where I normally live in Southeast Asia, uh, in some ways, uh, the region is tremendously suffering, but not just from COVID, but also from the economic consequences of the, the response uh, to COVID. I see that in Singapore, I see that in Thailand, I see that around uh, the region. But one thing is very clear, when this pandemic ends, and I'm always Mr. Optimist and it will end, uh, the reality is that Southeast Asia, my part of the world, will be even more important than ever before. And why do I say that? Partially it's because the trends that have taken place even before COVID included a revisiting of supply chains. Should everything be based in China, let's say, or should everything be based in one or two countries as a company thinks through the benefits of where they move their factories, uh, how they adjust their supply chains. That is indeed changing. We're seeing really already the consequences and benefits to a nation like Vietnam uh, where as things begin to shift and move. You know, supply chain shifts uh, uh, don't happen overnight, but the trend is very clear and COVID in some ways has, ex has accelerated that trend with lower uh, based uh, in terms of the, um, what you pay a factory worker. So countries that are paying lower wages than might actually be even now in China are going to benefit. And that means companies and businesses will also follow. So as I think about the US-China, the US-Europe, uh, the US-Asia relationship, my focus is indeed uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, for those who haven't been to our part of the world, do come visit. You know, there's something called the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN. Um, so that's 10 Southeast nations, you know, I wrote them down in case I forget them, but they are uh, Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Burma, uh, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. You know, some countries, people will know Thailand, but there are other countries, smaller countries like Laos, like a Brunei, that indeed are going to benefit once COVID has passed us, uh, as people rethink through where they should place their businesses, where they should uh, visit. You know, often people are surprised when I tell them there's more U.S. investment in these 10 nations of ASEAN collectively than there is in those countries that you always hear about, Brazil, Russia, India, China, add them all up, and there's still less U.S. investment in those four countries than there are in all uh, of ASEAN. So when I look at the numbers, you know, the data that I had most recently, some $2.8 trillion in GDP for a region of 650 million people. So you bring them all together. That's really uh, the most people in the world except for uh, China and India. So if you go forward and think through the regions of the world that will attract investment, that will attract uh, visitors, let's not rule out Southeast Asia. You know, even before COVID, for those who are focused more on leisure travel versus business travel, Bangkok often ranks number one in the world for the number of overnight international visitors. It's usually Bangkok uh, and London, you know, they're, they're kind of duking it out. Uh, and so clearly uh, what I'm seeing also just talking to business people, talking to friends is once COVID is over, we might well see revenge travel <laughs> where people who've been cooped up at home, you know, no matter who's the president, no matter who's leading the country, uh, uh, no matter what their business, they're gonna think through, now that I can travel, where do I wanna go? Certainly domestic travel, uh, will spike. Uh, we're seeing countries already trying to think through, given the lockdowns, how do we increase uh, 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 domestic travel, like a place like Thailand? How do we get people to fly around Thailand? But certainly international travel will also spike once this pandemic has passed us, as people think through about missed vacations, missed business meetings. And there again, I see Southeast Asia benefiting. You know, I'm now based right now in the U.S. temporarily, but when I'm in Southeast Asia, the reality there is there's so much inside Asia travel. So Chinese visiting a Thailand or an Indonesia, uh, Hong Kong people going to the Philippines, uh, all that is closed uh, for a large part right now. 
and that will change and Southeast Asia will clearly uh, benefit. Uh, so the short answer to your question is that the trend was there even before the pandemic for business reasons, for travel and reason reasons, uh, reasons uh, Southeast Asia is increasingly on people's interest list and that will only accelerate after the pandemic. Curtis, thank you very much. And finally, over to Rob, who is based in the United Kingdom. And now that the scope of the UK's post-Brexit migration policies is becoming clearer, what can we say about the openness of Britain to international migration in the coming years? Well, I think that there's a fundamental shift, a philosophical shift in what we've seen of Britain's political uh, sort of relationship with migration uh, over the last four or five years. And finally, we've seen that start to crystallize into actual policies that say something about the way that the UK is perceiving itself in this post-Brexit environment. I think that one of the most telling of these policies is the government's recent decision to uh, potentially create a path to citizenship for large numbers of uh, Chinese, uh, well, of Hong Kong uh, residents rather, um, uh, who have British national overseas passports. This is something which would have been probably inconceivable um, just four or five years ago. Uh, on the basis that the UK's policies were so fundamentally focused on this single-minded objective of reducing net migration to the tens of thousands. Um, so we're now in a situation where even though those BNO passports are unlikely to, to we think, necessarily generate huge flows of migration into the UK, they speak of a change in the way that the government is looking at the issue. Now, when we actually look more specifically at what has been done to dismantle the underpinnings of the net migration target, we see that a, a series of choices have been made, which, while they may seem considerably more restrictive for European citizens, because of course they introduce a salary threshold um, and, they, and, and skills requirements for people who may wish to travel to the UK in order to live and work there in the future, they also actually reduce the requirements for those salaries and skills, uh, for salaries and skills uh, for people from the rest of the world. So for example, we see the, the 30,000 pound minimum income threshold for people wanting to travel to, the work, to, to work in the UK reduced to 25,600 pounds. That makes a substantial difference. We also see a removal of the requirement for people to be working in graduate level jobs in order to travel to the UK. So this essentially opens up a whole world of middle skilled jobs and middle salary jobs that were potentially not available for people from non-European countries before to come and travel to the UK. Now, of course, there is a fundamental question about whether or not COVID and the implications of that on the UK labour market will actually mean that those jobs are there. But I think that the, that fundamental shift in the philosophy is apparent. And then beyond that, we also see uh, a reduction in the, in the settlement requirements for people to stay in the UK in the longer term. This has been announced only a few weeks ago. Uh, so again, we see a reduction in the amount of money that people have to earn to, to settle in the UK after five years from £35,000 or approximately £35,000 to, uh, to, uh, to, again, £25,600. So this is a big shift in the way that the UK is operating and in the way that, uh, in the way that, that it sees itself and its relationship with the rest of the world. And I think that this is something quite interesting because we saw with the Brexit referendum uh, uh, policies which were broadly seen to be extremely anti-migration being, being at the fore. People, people standing on a, on a platform of taking back control and reducing migration. And in fact, what we see instead is a much greater openness apart from to those people from the EU. Um, and I think that that speaks to a sense within the British public that there is that, 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 that having left the EU, we do have a, an ability to manage numbers in a way that we never did before. 
or not never did, but that we did that we hadn't done since uh, since free movement became uh, feasible within the EU uh, for UK citizens and for EU citizens to the UK. Thank you very much. Justice, perhaps the greatest surprise of the COVID-19 pandemic was Africa's defiance, if you will, of the early doom and gloom predictions about the devastating spread of the virus. Could this mark the beginnings of an easing of the onerous restrictions on African mobility outside the continent? Thank you, Hugh. Um, uh, yes, I, I think that the, what happened particularly uh, with this uh, pandemic was took the world by surprise. There was an expectation that uh, the brunt of the pandemic would be borne by African uh, countries. We haven't seen that come through. And, um, and, you know, one hopes that this momentum is kept and the pandemic doesn't uh, intensify, uh, as some of the other panelists have pointed out. For me, there are three elements that bode well for um, mobility of Africans outside, outside the continent. Um, I think, you know, Rob referred to a, a philosophical shift. And I think, I think it's worth reflecting on how the world is beginning to look at mobility in general. Um, if one is privileged enough to have uh, uh, a passport that allows one to uh, enter the sorts of destinations that, uh, for example, a US passport used to afford one, um, there is a conversation, you know, starting with whether it's Black Lives Matter to all kinds of social movements that are beginning to say, where does these, where do these uh, privileges emanate from and why is it they are not extended to others? I think that philosophically there will be uh, more of a discussion around those issues. But there are several, uh, uh, for me, key uh, policy issues that will lead to uh, changes. One, um, um, Cathy spoke about uh, inside China travel. In, in, in Africa, there hasn't been enough of that. I'm looking at some numbers here. Um, if uh, 65 trips in Europe um, crossed into another European country uh, for every 100 Europeans in 2016, in Africa, just four trips for every 100 Africans were to other African countries. Um, that is because, you know, the, the, the ability to travel from just one country to another is so restricted by visa regulations and so forth and so forth. Um, the African Union a few years ago passed, um, passed a resolution to implement visa-free travel uh, between the AU's 55 member countries. That was supposed to be implemented finally this year. I, I don't think it's going to happen due to uh, COVID-19, but it's the beginnings in my view of something that would be quite huge for the continent. Um, anecdotally, you know, people like me who travel on the continent a lot um, have always struggled to move from one country to another. And this would be, I can tell you, or, you know, or just at a personal level, a huge boon. Economically, um, the, the implications are massive. And I think I think that's the beginning of something that would be that would be a great uh, positive uh, for the continent. Globally, I think that political changes taking place across the United States uh, may lead to um, changes to the severe immigration policies uh, restrictions on uh, people from the global south. Um, and, and I think Africa will, will benefit from that. I think that um, if the new administration uh, relaxes, and I expect it fully to do so, uh, relaxes some of the uh, immigration regulations that have come through over the past four years, um, that will lead to greater um, African uh, mobility. And so, so you know, I think there's a philosophical shift. I think that there is a policy movement in Africa to open up uh, the continent's borders to uh, intra-Africa travel. And, and finally, I think that while the political changes that are 
currently taking place in the United States, um, if they are solidified, um, I think that there will be major changes uh, happening in that regard. Thank you very much indeed. That's very interesting. Demetrios, as, as countries battle to address the massive economic and employment challenges unleashed by the pandemic, will they continue to look mostly inward or do you think they will work harder to cooperate in their regions and beyond? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Hugh. And um, it is really, you know, the, 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 the very, the most important thing that we need to examine. Clearly, during the pandemic and particularly the height of the pandemic, the tendency is to look inward. And this is exactly what has happened in the past um, nine months, 10 months, a year, whatever. But I think gradually countries are coming to the point of realizing that the case for cooperation is a very strong case. What will make cooperation easier is if we can reestablish trust, trust between our governments and the governed, but also our government with another government. So I expect that if we can just continue to build on that trust requirement, we can actually cooperate more. The other thing that's required, or I should perhaps say that at the very heart of this, you know, uh, trust in each other more is leadership. And I know my colleagues have made references uh, to the election, and um, the election looks like it's going to be, you know, a, a Biden, a Democratic um, administration. Um, it will require enormous amounts of leadership on the part of the new administration. And I'm not quite certain that that leadership, at least in the first six or nine months, will actually lead in the direction of changing policy. I know that it will lead strongly in the direction of changing the tone of the United States as it relates to all of the other countries and to other world leaders. But changing policy is going to be a very difficult matter in large part because in the United States, as many of us um, know, certainly all the people around this table, uh, the president has much more power than people think and much less power than people think. And I would wait to see what the results of the Senate uh, will be uh, in addition to a Biden presidency before I can make a sort of a judgment as to how things will turn out. But cooperation is understood to be essential by everyone except the current administration, or at least the head of the current administration. Thank you very much, Hugh. Thank you very much indeed. Curtis, <clears throat> Singapore has been sitting comfortably in the top two positions on the Henley Passport Index for some time. Considering pandemic-related travel bans, Singaporeans can currently access fewer than 80 destinations. What do you think are some of the lessons learned from one of the world's true city-states, which is so reliant on its international connections? Thank you, Hugh. Indeed, when I think about uh, Singapore, it really is one of the few city-states in the world. And, and with a place that has so few resources, connectivity has been key to Singapore's success. Um, you know, I want to answer away by reading uh, a quote that uh, Singapore's trade and industry minister Chan Chan Singh said uh, earlier this month in November, uh, he was talking about as, as the uh, supply chain, as the footprints of companies change in the long and medium term, you know, he was asked, what do you think about that? Um, and he said, interesting, that post COVID, uh, that shift in the global footprints of supply chains are really a net plus for Singapore, for a country without natural resources. Chan added that this will allow the city state to further transcend our geographical signs and geographical location. The question, he said, is really how connected we are, Singaporeans, Singapore, with the rest of the world. 
And so, you know, I, I wanted to share that uh, quote from the minister who may well go on to bigger things in Singapore, uh, because it underscores that what's happening is also a redefinition of global mobility. You know, we all talk about passports, and if you have a US passport or a Singapore pa passport traditionally, and one day soon again, it was so easy to travel. But clearly, the consequences of COVID-19 and the pandemic has kind of trumped that passport. It's really how well your, your country's leadership, others have talked about leadership, has handled uh, COVID in your own uh, country. I was struck even uh, right now by uh, earlier this month in November, China, which has done relatively a good job, but starkly in terms of how it's dealt with it, versus how a place like a Taiwan or a New Zealand or South Korea has dealt with the pandemic. Uh, but China, in dealing starkly and sharply with this, most recently has now just banned, I think, citizens from the UK, from Belgium, from India, uh, from the Philippines. Even though early on, China was one of the first to say, these travel bans aren't right. Uh, it's racist. Uh, and so I think the reality is that we can look at the past rhetoric uh, facing the reality of today as countries need to do what is right for their own citizens. So Singapore too is dealing with that and struggling with that. But for me, one of the great lessons of Singapore, this great uh, city state where I'm often based, uh, as you noted with the Milton Institute, is the notion of innovation, of entrepreneurship and creativity. And that's how Singapore has also handled this. You know, Singapore, like many countries, had its own rough patches early on when they didn't pay enough attention to the spread of COVID in dormitories where migrant workers uh, uh, were living. But Singapore has addressed that. And in addressing that, they are moving forward. And it's allowed, actually right now, the creation of some of what we're calling travel corridors that may be Singapore, Brunei, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, countries, uh, these countries, these places, their citizens now will be able to more easily travel between these two. And I see that even at my own work at the Milken Institute. You know, this December, we're having uh, our big annual convening, what we call an Asia Summit, which was delayed from earlier this year to COVID. That's taking place now in December, but where traditionally we've had thousands of people fly into Singapore, we have had to adjust. And here again, I see a lesson from Singapore. We've been able to adjust because of a great partnership with the Singapore government. So in partnership with the Singapore Monetary Authority, we're still doing our Asia Summit. Um, and it won't be like this panel, simply a virtual uh, panel. Singapore is again being created, paying attention to both health and the economy. And it's going to be more of a hybrid uh, conference. So clearly uh, virtual, a lot of sessions virtually, but taking advantage of these new developments with travel corridors. We're having people fly in uh, from elsewhere in the region, a limited number, and they again are going to have to have strict guidance to address the health issue. But it shows how Singapore has been innovative and kind of the fun part for this conference. It's not just virtual, uh, it's not just in person, but I think Singapore is leading the way. We're working with holograms. So people are coming in by hologram. Let's see how that plays out. But you think about all these different ways people can show up at an event, in person, virtual, or now by hologram. It's all about creativity, innovation, piloting things to figure out what then will we move to a larger scale and move forward. So when I say to the world, you know, we're all, you know, hunkering down in our own homes. I mean, I think all of us on this panel are very blessed to be able to do so. So many people are struggling in this world. How do we help them? How do we reach out while doing things like these big events where people used to uh, fly together? How do we involve people when traditionally a place like Singapore, this isn't just these conferences, but the add-ons, the businesses and the hotel industries, the restaurants also would have benefited. So I think as we think through how we move forward, we need to also redefine global mobility. It won't just be like the old days and it won't be just a few good places. We need to be creative and that's where again, I look to a place uh, like Singapore. And these, sometimes you say, you know, when you've got nothing, when you've got no resources, you've got to be innovative. And I'm looking forward to seeing more of that from Singapore, but also from smaller places, the Hong Kongs, the Taiwans of the world. I think a lot of countries can learn from each other. And I think everyone on this panel, I think is looking forward to a, a world where there's more cooperation and coming together. And how that happens will be with or without passports is the reality. But again, I think to your very uh, important question about lessons learned from Singapore, Singapore has much to offer the world, but then we each need to think through, will that really work in my country? You know, if Singapore is doing great things, but Singapore's 5 million people, right? In a place with 7 million people, 10 million people, how can we take what they're doing and bring it back to our own uh, countries? Thank you very much indeed for that uh, excellent comment. And thank you all for your valuable time and contribution to this fascinating debate. And thanks also to all our guests who have joined us online. 
please join us again on Thursday the 17th of November at 9.30 GMT for the next session of our 14th Annual Global Citizenship Conference, which will focus on the concept of sovereign equity, a phrase coined by Henley and Partners to describe the unique capacity of investment migration to provide a liquidity injection of debt-free capital that can be used to buffer the impact of the corona pandemic and create significant societal value. Thank you.